Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. We have reached part four of The Marvelous Land of Oz by L. Frank Baum, the penultimate episode. Tip has now amassed quite a large group as he returns to the Emerald City to help the Scarecrow regain his kingdom. As well as himself and the Scarecrow, there's Jack Pumpkinhead, the Wooden Sawhorse, the Tin Woodman, and of course, the highly magnified Wogglebug. And now they have reached the gates of the city, despite the best efforts of Momby the Cruel Witch. Will they manage to get into the city? Will the Scarecrow regain his crown? It's time to pull up a chair, relax, and enjoy part four of The Marvellous Land of Oz by L. Frank Baum. The Prisoners of the Queen Approaching the gateway of the Emerald City, the travellers found it guarded by two girls of the Army of Revolt who opposed their entrance by drawing the knitting needles from their hair and threatening to prod the first that came near. But the Tin Woodman was not afraid. At the worst, they can but scratch my beautiful nickel plate, he said. But there will be no worst, for I think I can manage to frighten these absurd soldiers very easily. Follow me closely, all of you. Then, swinging his axe in a great circle to right and left before him, he advanced upon the gate, and the others followed him without hesitation. The girls, who had expected no resistance whatever, were terrified by the sweep of the glittering axe and fled screaming into the city, so that our travellers passed the gates in safety and marched down the green marble pavement of the wide street toward the royal palace. At this rate we will soon have your majesty upon the throne again, said the tin woodman, laughing at his easy conquest of the guards. Thank you, friend Nick, returned the scarecrow gratefully. Nothing can resist your kind heart and your sharp axe. As they passed the rows of houses they saw through the open doors that men were sweeping and dusting and washing dishes, while the women sat around in groups gossiping and laughing. What has happened? the scarecrow asked a sad-looking man with a bushy beard, who wore an apron and was wheeling a baby carriage along the sidewalk. "'Why, we've had a revolution, Your Majesty, as you ought to know very well,' replied the man, "'and since you went away the women have been running things to suit themselves. I'm glad you have decided to come back and restore order, for doing housework and minding the children is wearing out the strength of every man in the Emerald City.' "'Hmm,' said the scarecrow thoughtfully. If it is such hard work as you say, how did the women manage it so easily? I really don't know, replied the man with a deep sigh. Perhaps the women are made of cast iron. No movement was made as they passed along the street to oppose their progress. Several of the women stopped their gossip long enough to cast curious looks upon our friends, but immediately they would turn away with a laugh or a sneer and resume their chatter and when they met with several girls belonging to the Army of Revolt, these soldiers, instead of being alarmed or appearing surprised, merely stepped out of the way and allowed them to advance without protest. This action rendered the Scarecrow uneasy. "'I'm afraid we are walking into a trap,' said he. "'Nonsense,' returned Nick Chopper confidently. "'The silly creatures are conquered already!' The Scarecrow shook his head in a way that expressed doubt, and Tip said— it's too easy altogether. Look out for trouble ahead. I will, returned his majesty. Unopposed, they reached the royal palace and marched up the marble steps, which had once been thickly crusted with emeralds, but were now filled with tiny holes where the jewels had been ruthlessly torn from their settings by the army of revolt, and so far not a rebel barred their way. Through the arched hallways and into the magnificent throne room marched the tin woodman and his followers, and here, where the green silken curtains fell behind them, they saw a curious sight. Seated within the glittering throne was General Ginger, with the Scarecrow's second-best crown upon her head, and the royal sceptre in her right hand. A box of caramels from which she was eating rested in her lap, and the girl seemed entirely at ease in her royal surroundings. The Scarecrow stepped forward and confronted her, while the Tin Woodman leaned upon his axe and the others formed a half-circle back of His Majesty's person. "'How dare you sit in my throne?' demanded the Scarecrow, sternly eyeing the intruder. "'Don't you know you are guilty of treason, and that there is law against treason?' 
The throne belongs to whoever is able to take it, answered Ginger, as she slowly ate another caramel. I have taken it, as you see. So just now I am the queen, and all who oppose me are guilty of treason and must be punished by the law you have just mentioned. This view of the case puzzled the scarecrow. How is it, friend Nick? he asked, turning to the tin woodman. Why, when it comes to law, I have nothing to say, answered that personage, for laws were never meant to be understood, and it is foolish to make the attempt. Then what should we do? asked the scarecrow in dismay. Why don't you marry the queen, and then you can both rule, suggested the wogglebug. Ginger glared at the insect fiercely. Why don't you send her back to her mother where she belongs, asked Jack Pumpkinhead. Ginger frowned. "'Why don't you shut her up in a closet until she behaves herself and promises to be good?' inquired Tip. Ginger's lip curled scornfully. "'Or oh, give her a good shaking,' added the sawhorse. "'No,' said the tin woodman. "'We must treat the poor girl with gentleness. Let us give her all the jewels she can carry and send her away happy and contented.' At this, Queen Ginger laughed aloud, and the next minute clapped her pretty hands together thrice, as if for a signal. "'You are all absurd creatures,' said she, "'but I am tired of your nonsense and have no time to bother with you longer.' While the monarch and his friends listened in amazement to this impudent speech, a startling thing happened. The tin woodman's axe was snatched from his grasp by some person behind him, and he found himself disarmed and helpless. At the same time, a shout of laughter rang in the ears of the devoted band, and turning to see whence this came— they found themselves surrounded by the army of revolt, the girls bearing in either hand their glistening knitting needles. The entire throne room seemed to be filled with the rebels, and the scarecrow and his comrades realised that they were prisoners. "'You see how foolish it is to oppose a woman's wit,' said Ginger gaily, "'and this event only proves that I am more fit to rule the Emerald City than a scarecrow. I bear you no ill will, I assure you, but lest you should prove troublesome for me in the future, I shall order you all to be destroyed. That is, except the boy, who belongs to old Mombi and must be restored to her keeping. The rest of you are not human, and therefore it will not be wicked to demolish you. The sawhorse and the pumpkinhead's body I will have chopped up for kindling wood, and the pumpkin shall be made into tarts. The scarecrow will do nicely to start a bonfire, and the tin man can be cut into small pieces and fed to the goats. As for this immense wogglebug... Highly magnified, if you please, interrupted the insect. I think I will ask the cook to make green turtle soup of you, continued the queen reflectively. The wogglebug shuddered. Or, oh, if that won't do, we might use you for a Hungarian goulash, stewed and highly spiced, she added cruelly. The programme of extermination was so terrible that the prisoners looked upon one another in a panic of fear. The scarecrow alone did not give way to despair. He stood quietly before the queen, and his brow was wrinkled in deep thought as he strove to find some means to escape. While thus engaged, he felt the straw within his breast move gently. At once his expression changed from sadness to joy, and raising his hand he quickly unbuttoned the front of his jacket. This action did not pass unnoticed by the crowd of girls clustering about him, but none of them suspected what he was doing, until a tiny grey mouse leaped from his bosom to the floor and scampered away between the feet of the army of revolt. Another mouse quickly followed, then another and another in rapid succession and suddenly such a scream of terror went up from the army that it might easily have filled the stoutest heart with consternation. The flight that ensued turned to a stampede, and the stampede to a panic. For while the startled mice rushed wildly around the room, the scarecrow had only time to note a whirl of skirts and a twinkling of feet as the girls disappeared from the palace, pushing and crowding one another in their mad efforts to escape. The queen, at the first alarm, stood up on the cushions of the throne and began to dance frantically upon her tiptoes. Then a mouse ran up the cushions, and with a terrified leap, poor Ginger shot clear over the head of the scarecrow and escaped through an archway, never pausing in her wild career until she had reached the city gates. So in less time than I can explain, the throne room was deserted by all save the scarecrow and his friends, and the wogglebug heaved a deep sigh of relief as he exclaimed, "'Thank goodness!' We're saved. For a time, yes, answered the tin woodman, but the enemy will soon return, I fear. Let us bar all the entrances to the palace, said the scarecrow. 
Then we shall have time to think what is best to be done. So all except Jack Pumpkinhead, who was still tied fast to the sawhorse, ran to the various entrances of the royal palace and closed the heavy doors, bolting and locking them securely. Then, knowing that the army of revolt could not batter down the barriers in several days, the adventurers gathered once more in the throne room for a council of war. The Scarecrow Takes Time to Think It seems to me, began the Scarecrow, when all were again assembled in the throne room, that the girl Ginger is quite right in claiming to be queen. And if she is right, then I am wrong, and we have no business to be occupying her palace. But you were the king until she came, said the Wogglebug, strutting up and down with his hands in his pockets, so it appears to me that she is the interloper instead of you. "'Especially as we have just conquered her and put her to flight,' added the pumpkin head, as he raised his hands to turn his face towards the scarecrow. "'Have we really conquered her?' asked the scarecrow quietly. "'Look out of the window and tell me what you see.' Tip ran to the window and looked out. "'The palace is surrounded by a double row of girl soldiers,' he announced. "'I thought so.' returned the Scarecrow. We are as truly their prisoners as we were before the mice frightened them from the palace. My friend is right, said Nick Chopper, who had been polishing his breast with a bit of chamois leather. Ginger is still the Queen, and we are her prisoners. But I hope she cannot get at us, exclaimed the pumpkin head with a shiver of fear. She threatened to make tarts of me, you know. "'Don't worry,' said the Tin Woodman. "'It cannot matter greatly. "'If you stay shut up here, you will spoil in time anyway. "'A good tart is far more admirable than a decayed intellect.' "'Very true,' agreed the Scarecrow. "'Oh, dear,' moaned Jack. "'What an unhappy lot is mine. "'Why, dear father, did you not make me out of tin, "'or even out of straw, so that I would keep indefinitely?' "'Shucks!' returned Tip indignantly. You ought to be glad that I made you at all. Then he added reflectively, everything has to come to an end sometime. But I beg to remind you, broke in the Wogglebug, who had a distressed look in his bulging round eyes, that this terrible Queen Ginger suggested making a goulash of me, me, the only highly magnified and thoroughly educated Wogglebug in the wide, wide world. I think it was a brilliant idea, remarked the Scarecrow approvingly. "'Don't you imagine he would make a better soup?' asked the Tin Woodman, turning towards his friend. "'Well, perhaps,' acknowledged the Scarecrow. The Wogglebug groaned. "'I can see in my mind's eye,' said he mournfully, "'the goats eating small pieces of my dear comrade, the Tin Woodman, "'while my soup is being cooked on a bonfire built of the sawhorse and Jack Pumpkinhead's body, "'and Queen Ginger watches me boil while she feeds the flames for my friend the Scarecrow.' The morbid picture cast a gloom over the entire party, making them restless and anxious. "'It can't happen for some time,' said the Tin Woodman, trying to speak cheerfully, "'for we shall be able to keep Ginger out of the palace until she manages to break down the doors. "'And in the meantime, I am liable to starve to death, and so is the Wogglebug,' announced Tip. "'As for me,' said the Wogglebug, "'I think that I could live for some time on Jack Pumpkinhead. "'Not that I prefer pumpkins for food, but I believe they are somewhat nutritious, and Jack's head is large and plump.' "'How heartless!' exclaimed the Tin Woodman, greatly shocked. "'Are we cannibals, let me ask, or are we faithful friends?' "'I see very clearly that we cannot stay shut up in this palace,' said the Scarecrow with decision. "'So let us end this mournful talk and try to discover a means to escape.' At this suggestion they all gathered eagerly around the throne, wherein was seated the Scarecrow, and as Tip sat down upon a stool there fell from his pocket a pepper-box which rolled upon the floor. "'What is this?' asked Nick Chopper, picking up the box. Oh, "'Be careful,' cried the boy. "'That is my powder of life. Don't spill it, for it is nearly gone.' "'And what is the powder of life?' inquired the Scarecrow, as Tip replaced the box carefully in his pocket. "'It's some magical stuff old Momby got from a crooked sorcerer,' explained the boy. "'She brought Jack to life with it, and afterward I used it to bring the sawhorse to life. I guess it will make anything live that is sprinkled with it, but there's only about one dose left.' "'Then it is very precious,' said the Tin Woodman. "'Indeed it is,' agreed the Scarecrow. "'It may prove our best means of escape from our difficulties. "'I believe I will think for a few minutes. "'So I will thank you, friend Tip, to get out your knife "'and rip this heavy crown from my forehead.' 
Tip soon cut the stitches that had fastened the crown to the scarecrow's head, and the former monarch of the Emerald City removed it with a sigh of relief and hung it on a peg beside the throne. "'That is my last memento of royalty,' said he, "'and I'm glad to get rid of it. The former king of this city, who was named Pastoria, lost the crown to the wonderful wizard, who passed it on to me. Now the girl Ginger claims it, and I sincerely hope it will not give her a headache.' "'A kindly thought, which I greatly admire,' said the Tin Woodman, nodding approvingly. "'And now I will indulge in a quick think,' continued the Scarecrow, lying back in the throne. The others remained as silent and still as possible so as not to disturb him, for all had great confidence in the extraordinary brains of the Scarecrow. And after what seemed a very long time indeed to the anxious watchers, the Thinker sat up, looked upon his friends with his most whimsical expression, and said— my brains work beautifully today. I'm quite proud of them. Now, listen, if we attempt to escape through the doors of the palace, we shall surely be captured, and as we can't escape through the ground, there is only one other thing to be done. We must escape through the air. He paused to note the effect of these words, but all his hearers seemed puzzled and unconvinced. The wonderful wizard escaped in a balloon, he continued, we don't know how to make a balloon, of course, but any sort of thing that can fly through the air can carry us easily. So I suggest that my friend the Tin Woodman, who is a skilful mechanic, shall build some sort of a machine with good strong wings to carry us, and our friend Tip can then bring the thing to life with his magical powder. Bravo! cried Nick Chopper. What splendid brains! murmured Jack. Really quite clever, said the educated Wogglebug. I believe it can be done, declared Tip. That is, if the Tin Woodman is equal to making the thing. I'll do my best, said Nick cheerfully, and as a matter of fact, I do not often fail in what I attempt, but the thing will have to be built on the roof of the palace so it can rise comfortably into the air. To be sure, said the Scarecrow. Then let us search through the palace, continued the Tin Woodman, and carry all the material we can find to the roof, where I will begin my work. First, however, said the pumpkin head, I beg you will release me from this horse and make me another leg to walk with, for in my present condition I am of no use to myself or to anyone else. So the tin woodman knocked a mahogany centre table to pieces with his axe and fitted one of the legs, which was beautifully carved, onto the body of Jack Pumpkinhead, who was very proud of the acquisition. It seems strange, said he as he watched the tin woodman work, that my left leg should be the most elegant and substantial part of me. That proves you are unusual, returned the scarecrow, and I am convinced that the only people worthy of consideration in this world are the unusual ones, for the common folks are like the leaves of a tree, and live and die unnoticed. Spoken like a philosopher, cried the wogglebug, as he assisted the tin woodman to set Jack upon his feet. How do you feel now? asked Tip watching the pumpkin head stump around, trying out his new leg. "'As good as new,' answered Jack joyfully, "'and quite ready to assist you all to escape.' "'Then let us get to work,' said the Scarecrow in a businesslike tone. So glad to be doing anything that might lead to the end of their captivity, the friends separated to wander over the palace in search of fitting material to use in the construction of their aerial machine." The Astonishing Flight of the Gump When the adventurers reassembled upon the roof, it was found that a remarkably queer assortment of articles had been selected by the various members of the party. No one seemed to have a very clear idea of what was required, but all had brought something. The Wogglebug had taken from its position under the mantelpiece in the great hallway the head of a gump, which was adorned with wide-spreading antlers, and this, with great care and greater difficulty, the insect had carried up the stairs to the roof. This gump resembled an elk's head, only the nose turned upward in a saucy manner, and there were whiskers upon its chin, like those of a billy goat. Why the Wogglebug selected this article he could not have explained, except that it had aroused his curiosity. Tip, with the aid of the sawhorse, had brought a large upholstered sofa to the roof. It was an old-fashioned piece of furniture, with high back and ends, and it was so heavy that even by resting the greatest weight upon the back of the sawhorse, the boy had found himself out of breath when at last the clumsy sofa was dumped on the roof. The pumpkin head, 
had brought a broom, which was the first thing he saw. The scarecrow arrived with a coil of clotheslines and ropes which he had taken from the courtyard, and in his trip up the stairs he had become so entangled in the loose ends of the ropes that both he and his burden tumbled in a heap upon the roof and might have rolled off if Tip had not rescued him. The tin woodman appeared last. He also had been to the courtyard, where he had cut four great spreading leaves from a huge palm tree that was the pride of all the inhabitants of the Emerald City. "'My dear Nick!' exclaimed the Scarecrow, seeing what his friend had done. "'You've been guilty of the greatest crime any person can commit in the Emerald City. "'If I remember rightly, the penalty for chopping leaves from the royal palm tree "'is to be killed seven times and afterward imprisoned for life.' "'It cannot be helped now,' answered the Tin Woodman, "'throwing down the big leaves upon the roof. "'But it may be one more reason why it is necessary for us to escape. "'And now let us see what you have found for me to work with.' Many were the doubtful looks cast upon the heap of miscellaneous material that now cluttered the roof, and finally the scarecrow shook his head and remarked, "'Well, if friend Nick can manufacture from this mess of rubbish a thing that will fly through the air and carry us to safety, then I will acknowledge him to be a better mechanic than I suspected.' But the tin woodman seemed at first by no means sure of his powers, and only after polishing his forehead vigorously with the chamois leather did he resolve to undertake the task. "'The first thing required for the machine,' said he, "'is a body big enough to carry the entire party. This sofa is the biggest thing we have, and might be used for a body. But should the machine ever tip sideways, we would all slide off and fall to the ground.' "'Why not use two sofas?' asked Tip. "'There's another one just like this downstairs.' "'That is a very sensible suggestion,' exclaimed the Tin Woodman. "'You must fetch the other sofa at once.' So Tip and the Sawhorse managed, with much labour, to get the second sofa to the roof, and when the two were placed together, edge to edge, the backs and ends formed a protecting rampart all around the seats. "'Excellent!' cried the Scarecrow. "'We can ride within this snug nest quite at our ease.' The two sofas were now bound firmly together with ropes and clotheslines, and then Nick Chopper fastened the gump's head to one end. "'That will show which is the front end of the thing,' said he, greatly pleased with the idea. "'And really, if you examine it critically, the gump looks very well as a figurehead. These great palm leaves, which I have endangered my life seven times, must serve us as wings.' "'Are they strong enough?' asked the boy. They are as strong as anything we can get, answered the woodman, and although they are not in proportion to the thing's body, we are not in a position to be very particular. So he fastened the palm leaves to the sofas, two on each side. Said the wogglebug with considerable admiration, the thing is now complete, and only needs to be brought to life. Stop a moment, exclaimed Jack. Are you not going to use my broom? What for? asked the scarecrow. Why, it can be fastened to the back end for a tail answered the pumpkin head. Surely you would not call the thing complete without a tail. Hmm, said the tin woodman. I do not see the use of a tail. We are not trying to copy a beast or a fish or a bird. All we ask of the thing is to carry us through the air. Perhaps after the thing is brought to life, it can use a tail to steer with, suggested the scarecrow, for if it flies through the air, it will not be unlike a bird and I've noticed that all birds have tails, which they use for a rudder while flying. "'Very well,' answered Nick. "'The broom shall be used for a tail,' and he fastened it firmly to the back end of the sofa body. Tip took the pepper box from his pocket. "'The thing looks very big,' said he anxiously, "'and I'm not sure if there's enough powder left to bring all of it to life, but I'll make it go as far as possible.' "'Put most on the wings,' said Nick Chopper, "'for they must be made as strong as possible.' "'And don't forget the head!' exclaimed the Wogglebug. "'Or the tail!' added Jack Pumpkinhead. "'Do be quiet!' said Tip nervously. "'You must give me a chance to work the magic charm in the proper manner.' Very carefully he began sprinkling the thing with the precious powder. Each of the four wings was first lightly covered with a layer, then the sofas were sprinkled, and the broom given a slight coating. "'The head! The head! Don't I beg of you forget the head!' cried the Wogglebug excitedly. "'There's only a little of the powder left,' announced Tip, looking within the box, "'and it seems to me it is more important to bring the legs to the sofa to life than the head.' "'Not so,' decided the Scarecrow. "'Everything must have a head to direct it, and since this creature is to fly, not walk, "'it is really unimportant whether its legs are alive or not.' "'So Tip abided by this decision, and sprinkled the gump's head with the remainder of the powder. "'Now,' 
said he. Keep silence while I work the charm. Having heard old Momby pronounce the magic words, and also having succeeded in bringing a sawhorse to life, Tip did not hesitate an instant in speaking the three cabalistic words, each accompanied by the peculiar gesture of the hands. It was a grave and impressive ceremony. As he finished the incantation, the thing shuddered throughout its huge bulk, the gump gave the screeching cry that is familiar to those animals, and then the four wings began flopping furiously. Tip managed to grasp a chimney, else he would have been blown off the roof by the terrible breeze raised by the wings. The scarecrow, being light in weight, was caught up bodily and borne through the air until Tip luckily seized him by one leg and held him fast. The wogglebug lay flat on the roof and so escaped harm, and the tin woodman, whose weight of tin anchored him firmly, threw both arms around Jack Pumpkinhead and managed to save him. The sawhorse toppled over on his back and lay with his legs waving helplessly above him. And now, while all were struggling to recover themselves, the thing rose slowly from the roof and mounted into the air. "'Here! Come back!' cried Tip in a frightened voice as he clung to the chimney with one hand and the scarecrow with the other. "'Come back at once! I command you!' It was now that the wisdom of the scarecrow in bringing the head of the thing to life instead of the legs was proved beyond a doubt, for the gump, already high in the air, turned its head at Tip's command and gradually circled around until it could view the roof of the palace. "'Come back!' shouted the boy again, and the gump obeyed, slowly and gracefully waving its four wings in the air until the thing had settled once more upon the roof and become still. In the Jackdaw's Nest "'This!' said the grump, in a squeaky voice not at all proportioned to the size of its great body, is the most novel experience I have ever heard of. The last thing I remember distinctly is walking through the forest and hearing a loud noise. Something probably killed me then, and it certainly ought to have been the end of me, yet here I am, alive again, with four monstrous wings and a body which I venture to say would make any respectable animal or fowl weep with shame to own. What does it all mean?' Am I a gump, or am I a juggernaut? The creature, as it spoke, wiggled its chin whiskers in a very comical manner. You're just a thing, answered Tip, with a gump's head on it, and we have made you and brought you to life so that you may carry us through the air wherever we wish to go. Very good, said the thing. As I am not a gump, I cannot have a gump's pride or independent spirit— so I may as well become your servant as anything else. My only satisfaction is that I do not seem to have a very strong constitution, and I'm not likely to live long in a state of slavery. Don't say that, I beg of you, cried the tin woodman, whose excellent heart was strongly affected by this sad speech. Are you not feeling well today? Oh, as for that, returned the gump, it is my first day of existence, so I cannot judge whether I am feeling well or ill and it waved its broom tail to and fro in a pensive manner. "'Come, come,' said the scarecrow kindly. "'Do try to be more cheerful and take life as you find it. We shall be kind, masters, and will strive to render your existence as pleasant as possible. Are you willing to carry us through the air to wherever we wish to go?' "'Certainly,' answered the gump. "'I greatly prefer to navigate the air, for should I travel on the earth and meet with one of my own species, my embarrassment would be something awful.' "'I can appreciate that,' said the Tin Woodman, sympathetically. "'And yet,' continued the thing, "'when I carefully look you over, my masters, "'none of you seems to be constructed much more artistically than I am.' "'Appearances are deceitful,' said the Wogglebug earnestly. "'I am both highly magnified and thoroughly educated.' "'Indeed,' murmured the Gump indifferently. "'And my brains are considered remarkably rare specimens,' added the Scarecrow proudly. "'How strange!' remarked the gump. "'Although I am of tin,' said the woodman, "'I own a heart altogether the warmest and most admirable in all the world.' "'I'm delighted to hear it,' replied the gump with a slight cough. "'My smile,' said Jack Pumpkinhead, "'is worthy of your best attention. It is always the same.' "'Semper idem,' explained the wogglebug pompously, "'and the gump turned to stare at him.' "'And I,' declared the sawhorse, filling in an awkward pause, "'am only remarkable because I can't help it.' "'I am proud indeed to meet with such exceptional masters,' said the gump in a careless tone. 
If I could but secure so complete an introduction to myself, I would be more than satisfied. That will come in time, remarked the Scarecrow. To know thyself is considered quite an accomplishment which it has taken us, who are your elders, months to perfect. But now, he added, turning to the others, let us get aboard and start upon our journey. Where shall we go? asked Tip as he clambered to a seat on the sofas and assisted the pumpkin head to follow him. In the South Country rules a very delightful queen called Glinda the Good, who I'm sure will gladly receive us, said the scarecrow, getting into the thing clumsily. Let us go to her and ask her advice. That is cleverly thought of, declared Nick Chopper, giving the wogglebug a boost and then toppling the sawhorse into the rear end of the cushioned seats. I know Glinda the Good and believe she will prove a friend indeed. Are we all ready? asked the boy. Yes, announced the tin woodman, seating himself beside the scarecrow. Then, said Tip, addressing the gump, be kind enough to fly with us to the southward, and do not go higher than to escape the houses and trees, for it makes me dizzy to be up so far. All right, answered the gump briefly. It flopped its four huge wings and rose slowly into the air, and then, while our little band of adventurers clung to the backs and sides of the sofas for support, the gump turned towards the south and soared swiftly and majestically away. The scenic effect from this altitude is marvellous, commented the educated wogglebug as they rode along. Never mind the scenery, said the scarecrow. Hold on tight or you may get a tumble. The thing looks to rock badly. It will be dark soon, said Tip, observing that the sun was low on the horizon. Perhaps we should have waited until morning. I wonder if the gump can fly in the night. I've been wondering that myself, returned the gump quietly. You see, this is a new experience for me. I used to have legs that carried me swiftly over the ground, but now my legs feel as if they were asleep. They are, said Tip. We didn't bring them to life. You're expected to fly, explained the scarecrow, not to walk. We can walk ourselves, said the wogglebug. I think I begin to understand what is required of me, remarked the gump, so I will do my best to please you and he flew on for a time in silence. Presently, Jack Pumpkinhead became uneasy. "'I wonder if riding through the air is liable to spoil pumpkins,' he said. "'Not unless you carelessly drop your head over the side,' answered the Wogglebug. "'In that event, your head would no longer be a pumpkin, for it would become a squash.' "'Have I not asked you to restrain these unfeeling jokes?' demanded Tip, looking at the Wogglebug with a severe expression. "'You have, and I've restrained a good many of them.' replied the insect, but there are opportunities for so many excellent puns in our language that, to an educated person like myself, the temptation to express them is almost irresistible. People with more or less education discovered those puns centuries ago, said Tip. Are you sure? asked the Wogglebug with a startled look. Of course I am, answered the boy. An educated Wogglebug may be a new thing, but a Wogglebug education is as old as the hills, judging from the display you make of it. The insect seemed much impressed by this remark, and for a time maintained a meek silence. The scarecrow, in shifting his seat, saw upon the cushions the pepper box which Tip had cast aside, and began to examine it. "'Throw it overboard,' said the boy. "'It's quite empty now, and there's no use keeping it.' "'Is it really empty?' asked the scarecrow, looking curiously into the box. "'Of course it is,' answered Tip. "'I shook out every grain of the powder.' Then the box has two bottoms, announced the scarecrow, for the bottom on the inside is fully an inch away from the bottom on the outside. Let me see, said the tin woodman, taking the box from his friend. Yes, he declared, looking it over, the thing certainly has a false bottom. Now I wonder what that is for. Can you get it apart and find out, inquired Tip, now quite interested in the mystery. Why, yes, the lower bottom unscrews, said the tin woodman. My fingers are rather stiff. Please see if you can open it. He handed the pepper box to Tip, who had no difficulty in unscrewing the bottom, and in the cavity below were three silver pills, with a carefully folded paper lying underneath them. This paper the boy proceeded to unfold, taking care not to spill the pills, and found several lines clearly written in red ink. "'Read it aloud,' said the scarecrow. So Tip read as follows. "'Dr. Nicky Dick's Celebrated Washing Pills. Directions for use. Swallow one pill, Count seventeen by twos, then make a wish. The wish will immediately be granted. Caution. Keep in a dry and dark place. Why, this is a very valuable discovery. It 
It is indeed, replied Tip gravely. These pills may be of great use to us. I wonder if old Mommy knew they were at the bottom of the pepper box. I remember hearing her say that she got the powder of life from this same Nicky Dick. He must be a powerful sorcerer, exclaimed the tin woodman, and since the powder proved a success, we ought to have confidence in the pills. But how, asked the scarecrow, can anyone count seventeen by twos? Seventeen is an odd number. That is true, replied Tip, greatly disappointed. No one can possibly count seventeen by twos. Then the pills are of no use to us, wailed the pumpkin head, and this fact overwhelms me with grief, for I had intended wishing that my head would never spoil. Nonsense, said the scarecrow sharply. If we could use the pills at all, we would make far better wishes than that. I do not see how anything could be better, protested poor Jack. If you were liable to spoil at any time, you could understand my anxiety. For my part, said the tin woodman, I sympathise with you in every respect, but since we cannot count seventeen by twos, sympathy is all you are liable to get. By this time, it had become quite dark, and the voyagers found above them a cloudy sky through which the rays of the moon could not penetrate. The gump flew steadily on, and for some reason the huge sofa body rocked more and more dizzily every hour. The wogglebug declared he was seasick, and Tip was also pale and somewhat distressed, but the others clung to the backs of the sofas and did not seem to mind the motion as long as they were not tipped out. Darker and darker drew the night, and on and on sped the gump through the black heavens. The travellers could not even see one another, and an oppressive silence settled down upon them. After a long time, Tip, who had been thinking deeply, spoke. "'How are we to know when we come to the palace of Glinda the Good?' he asked. "'It's a long way to Glinda's palace,' answered the woodman. "'I've travelled it.' "'But how are we to know how fast the gump is flying?' persisted the boy. We cannot see a single thing down on the earth, and before morning we may be far beyond the place we want to reach. That is all true enough, the scarecrow replied a little uneasily, but I do not see how we can stop just now, for we might alight in a river, or on top of a steeple, and that would be a great disaster. So they permitted the gump to fly on with regular flaps of its great wings, and waited patiently for morning. Then Tip's fears were proved to be well-founded, for with the first streaks of grey dawn they looked over the sides of the sofas and discovered rolling plains dotted with queer villages, where the houses, instead of being dome-shaped as they are in all the land of Oz, had slanting roofs that rose to a peak in the centre. Odd-looking animals were also moving about on the open plains, and the country was unfamiliar to both the Tin Woodman and the Scarecrow, who had formerly visited Glinda the Good's domain and knew it well. "'We are lost!' said the Scarecrow dolefully. "'The Gump must have carried us entirely out of the land of Oz "'and over the sandy deserts and on to the terrible outside world "'that Dorothy told us about.' "'We must get back!' exclaimed the Tin Woodman earnestly. "'We must get back as soon as possible!' "'Turn around!' cried Tip to the Gump. "'Turn as quickly as you can!' "'If I do, I shall upset!' answered the Gump. I'm not at all used to flying, and the best plan would be for me to alight in some place, and then I can turn around and take a fresh start. Just then, however, there seemed to be no stopping place that would answer their purpose. They flew over a village so big that the Wogglebug declared it was a city, and then they came to a range of high mountains with many deep gorges and steep cliffs showing plainly. Now is our chance to stop, said the boy, finding they were very close to the mountain tops. Then he turned to the gump and commanded, "'Stop at the first level place you see.' "'Very well,' answered the gump, and settled down upon a table of rock that stood between two cliffs. But not being experienced in such matters, the gump did not judge his speed correctly, and instead of coming to a stop upon the flat rock, he missed it by half the width of his body, breaking off both his right wings against the sharp edge of the rock, and then tumbling over and over down the cliff. Our friends held on to the sofas as long as they could, but when the gump caught on a projecting rock, the thing stopped suddenly bottom side up, and all were immediately dumped out. By good fortune, they fell only a few feet, for underneath them was a monster nest, built by a colony of jackdaws in a hollow ledge of rock, so none of them, not even the pumpkin head, was injured by the fall. For Jack found his precious head resting on the soft breast of the scarecrow, which made an excellent cushion, and Tip fell on a mass of leaves and papers, which saved him from injury. The Wogglebug had bumped his round head against the sawhorse, but without causing him more than a moment's inconvenience. 
The Tin Woodman was at first much alarmed, but finding he had escaped without even a scratch upon his beautiful nickel plate, he at once regained his accustomed cheerfulness and turned to address his comrades. "'Our journey had ended rather suddenly,' said he, "'and we cannot justly blame our friend the Gump for our accident, because he did the best he could under the circumstances. But how we are ever to escape from this nest I must leave to someone with better brains than I possess.' Here he gazed at the scarecrow, who crawled to the edge of the nest and looked over. Below them was a sheer precipice several hundred feet in depth. Above them was a smooth cliff, unbroken, save by the point of rock where the wrecked body of the gump still hung suspended from the end of one of the sofas. There really seemed to be no means of escape, and as they realised their helpless flight, the little band of adventurers gave way to their bewilderment. "'This is a worse prison than the palace,' sadly remarked the Wogglebug. "'I wish we'd stayed there,' moaned Jack. "'I'm afraid the mountain air isn't good for pumpkins.' "'It won't be when the jackdaws come back,' growled the sawhorse, which lay waving its legs in a vain endeavour to get upon its feet again. "'Jackdaws are especially fond of pumpkins.' "'You think the birds will come here?' asked Jack, much distressed. "'Of course they will,' said Tip, "'for this is their nest, and there must be hundreds of them,' he continued. "'For see, what a lot of things they have brought here.' Indeed, the nest was half filled with a most curious collection of small articles for which the birds could have no use, but which the thieving jackdaws had stolen during many years from the homes of men. And as the nest was safely hidden where no human being could ever reach it, this lost property would never be recovered. The Wogglebug, searching among the rubbish for the jackdaws stole useless things as well as valuable ones, turned up with his foot a beautiful diamond necklace. This was so greatly admired by the tin woodman that the Wogglebug presented it to him with a graceful speech, after which the woodman hung it around his neck with much pride, rejoicing exceedingly when the big diamonds glittered in the sun's rays. But now they heard a great jabbering and flapping of wings, and as the sound grew nearer to them, Tip exclaimed, "'The jackdaws are coming, and if they find us here they will surely kill us in their anger.' "'I was afraid of this,' moaned the pumpkin head. "'My time has come.' "'And mine also,' said the Wogglebug, "'for jackdaws are the greatest enemies of my race.' The others were not at all afraid, but the scarecrow decided at once to save those of the party who were liable to be injured by the angry birds, so he commanded Tip to take off Jack's head and lie down with it in the bottom of the nest, and when this was done, he ordered the Wogglebug to lie beside Tip. Nick Chopper, who knew from past experience just what to do, then took the scarecrow to pieces, all except his head, and scattered the straw over Tip and the Wogglebug, completely covering their bodies. Hardly had this been accomplished when the flock of jackdaws reached them. Perceiving the intruders in their nest, the birds flew down upon them with screams of rage. Dr. Nickadick's Famous Wishing Pills The Tin Woodman was usually a peaceful man, but when occasion required he could fight as fiercely as a Roman gladiator. So when the jackdaws nearly knocked him down in their rush of wings and their sharp beaks and claws threatened to damage his brilliant plating, the Woodman picked up his axe and made it whirl swiftly around his head. But although many were beaten off in this way, the birds were so numerous and so brave that they continued the attack as furiously as before. Some of them pecked at the eyes of the gump, which hung over the nest in a helpless condition, but the gump's eyes were of glass and could not be injured. Others of the jackdaws rushed at the sawhorse, but that animal, being still upon its back, kicked out so viciously with his wooden legs that he beat off as many assailants as did the woodman's axe. Finding themselves thus opposed, the birds fell upon the scarecrow's straw which lay at the centre of the nest, covering Tip and the Wogglebug and Jack's pumpkin head, and began tearing it away and flying off with it, only to let it drop, straw by straw, into the great gulf beneath. The scarecrow's head, noting with dismay this wanton destruction of his interior, cried to the tin woodman to save him, and that good friend responded with renewed energy. His axe fairly flashed among the jackdaws, and fortunately, the gump began wildly waving the two wings remaining on the left side of his body. The flutter of those great wings filled the jackdaws with terror, and when the gump by its exertions freed itself from the peg of rock on which it hung and sank flapping down into the nest, the alarm of the birds knew no bounds, and they fled screaming over the mountains. When the last foe had disappeared, 
Tip crawled from under the sofas and assisted the Wogglebug to follow him. "'We're saved!' shouted the boy delightedly. "'We are indeed!' responded the educated insect, fairly hugging the stiff head of the gump in his joy, and we owe it all to the flopping of the thing and the good axe of the woodman. "'If I am saved, get me out of here,' called Jack, whose head was still beneath the sofas, and Tip managed to roll the pumpkin out and place it upon its neck again. He also set the sawhorse upright and said to it, "'We owe you many thanks for the gallant fight you made.' "'I really think we have escaped very nicely,' remarked the tin woodman in a tone of pride. "'Not so!' exclaimed a hollow voice. At this, they all turned in surprise to look at Scarecrow's head, which lay at the back of the nest. "'I am completely ruined!' declared the Scarecrow, as he noted their astonishment. "'For where is the straw that stuffs my body?' The awful question startled them all. They gazed round the nest with horror, for not a vestige of straw remained. The jackdaws had stolen it to the last wisp and flung it all into the chasm that yawned for hundreds of feet beneath the nest. "'My poor, poor friend,' said the tin woodman, taking up the scarecrow's head and caressing it tenderly. "'Whoever could imagine you would come to this untimely end?' "'I did it to save my friends,' returned the head, and I am glad that I perished in so noble and unselfish a manner. But why are you all so despondent? inquired the Wogglebug. The Scarecrow's clothing is still safe. Yes, answered the Tin Woodman, but our friend's clothes are useless without stuffing. Why not stuff him with money? asked Tip. Money? they all cried in an amazed chorus. To be sure, said the boy, in the bottom of the nest there are thousands of dollar bills and two dollar bills and five dollar bills and tens and twenties and fifties. There are enough of them to stuff a dozen scarecrows. Why not use the money? The tin woodman began to turn over the rubbish with the handle of his axe, and sure enough, what they had first thought were only worthless papers were found to be all bills of various denominations, which the mischievous jackdaws had for years been engaged in stealing from the villages and cities they visited. There was an immense fortune lying in that inaccessible nest, and Tip's suggestion was, with the scarecrow's consent, quickly acted upon. They selected all the newest and cleanest bills and sorted them into various piles. The scarecrow's left leg and boot were stuffed with $5 bills, his right leg was stuffed with $10 bills, and his body so closely filled with 50s, 100s and 1000s that he could scarcely button his jacket with comfort. "'You are now,' said the Wogglebug, impressively, when the task had been completed, "'the most valuable member of our party. "'And as you are among the most faithful friends, there is little danger of your being spent.' "'Thank you,' returned the Scarecrow gratefully. "'I feel like a new man, and although at first glance I might be mistaken for a safety deposit vault, "'I beg you to remember that my brains are still composed of the same old material, "'and these are the possessions that have always made me a person to be depended upon in emergency.' "'Well, the emergency is here,' observed Tip, "'and unless your brain helps us out of it, "'we shall be compelled to pass the remainder of our lives in this nest.' "'What about those wishing pills?' inquired the Scarecrow, "'taking the box from his jacket pocket. "'Can't we use them to escape?' "'Not unless we can count seventeen by twos,' answered the Tin Woodman, "'but our friend the Wogglebug claims to be highly educated, "'so he ought easily to figure out how that can be done. "'It isn't a question of education.' returned the insect. It is merely a question of mathematics. I've seen the professor work lots of sums on the backboard, and he claimed anything could be done with X's and Y's and Y's and A's and such things, by mixing them up with plenty of pluses and minuses and equals and so forth. But he never said anything, so far as I remember, about counting up to the odd number of 17 by the even numbers of two. Stop, stop, cried the pumpkin head. You're making my head ache. And mine, added the scarecrow. Your mathematics seem to me very like a box of mixed pickles. The more you fish for what you want, the less chance you have of getting it. I am certain that if the thing can be accomplished at all, it is a very simple matter. Yes, said Tip. Old Mombi couldn't use X's and minuses, for she never went to school. Why not start counting at a half of one? asked the sawhorse abruptly. Then anyone can count up to seventeen by twos very easily. They looked at each other in surprise, for the sawhorse was considered the most stupid of the entire party. "'You make me quite ashamed of myself,' said the scarecrow, bowing low to the sawhorse. "'Nevertheless, the creature is right,' declared the wogglebug, "'for twice half one is one, and if you can get to one, it is easy to count from one up to seventeen by twos.' "'I wonder I didn't think of that myself,' said the pumpkin head. 
I don't, returned the Scarecrow. You're no wiser than the rest of us, are you? But let us all make a wish at once. Who will swallow the first pill? Suppose you do it, suggested Tip. I can't, said the Scarecrow. Why not? You've got a mouth, haven't you? asked the boy. Yes, but my mouth is painted on, and there's no swallow connected with it, answered the Scarecrow. In fact, he continued, looking from one to another critically, I believe the boy and the wogglebug are the only ones in our party that are able to swallow. Observing the truth of this remark, Tip said, Then I will undertake to make the first wish. Give me one of the silver pills. This the Scarecrow tried to do, but his padded gloves were too clumsy to clutch so small an object, and he held the box towards the boy while Tip selected one of the pills and swallowed it. Count, cried the Scarecrow. One half, one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, counted Tip, thirteen, fifteen, seventeen. Now wish, said the Tin Woodman anxiously, but just then the boy began to suffer such fearful pains that he became alarmed. The pill has poisoned me, he gasped. Oh, oh, ouch, murder, fire, oh! And here he rolled upon the bottom of the nest in such contortions that he frightened them all. What can we do for you? Speak, I beg, entreated the tin woodman, tears of sympathy running down his nickel cheeks. I, I don't know, answered Tip. Oh, I wish I'd never swallowed that pill. Then at once the pain stopped, and the boy rose to his feet again and found the scarecrow looking with amazement at the end of the pepper box. "'What's happened?' asked the boy, a little ashamed of his recent exhibition. "'Why, the three pills are in the box again,' said the scarecrow. "'Of course they are,' the wogglebug declared. "'Didn't Tip wish that he'd never swallowed one of them? Well, the wish came true, and he didn't swallow one of them. So, of course, they are all three in the box.' "'That... May be, but the pill gave me a dreadful pain just the same. Impossible, declared the Bucklebug. If you have never swallowed it, the pill cannot have given you a pain, and as your wish, being granted, proves you did not swallow the pill, it is also plain that you suffered no pain. Then it was a splendid imitation of a pain, retorted Tip angrily. Suppose you try the next pill yourself. We've wasted one already. Oh, no, we haven't, protested the Scarecrow. Here are still three little pills in the box, and each pill is good for a wish. "'Now you're making my head ache,' said Tip. I, "'I can't understand the thing at all, but I won't take another pill, I promise you.' And with this remark he retired sulkily to the back of the nest. "'Well,' said the Wogglebug, "'it remains for me to save us in my most highly magnified and thoroughly educated manner, for I seem to be the only one able and willing to make a wish. Let me have one of the pills.' He swallowed it without hesitation, and they all stood admiring his courage while the insect counted seventeen by twos in the same way that Tip had done, and for some reason, perhaps because wogglebugs have stronger stomachs than boys, the silver pellet caused it no pain whatever. "'I wish the gump's broken wings mended, and as good as new,' said the wogglebug in a slow, impressive voice. All turned to look at the thing, and so quickly had the wish been granted that the gump lay before them in perfect repair— and as well able to fly through the air as when it had been first brought to life on the roof of the palace. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed part four of The Marvellous Land of Oz. If you did enjoy it, then please consider supporting The Well Told Tale on Patreon at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next week with the finale to the story. I hope you can join me.